Okay, we're back. Got the strings cut out, got the bumper guard replaced. We're all in good shape here. Butt cap upright. Let's get this thing mounted and then strung, as I already mentioned. This is going to be strung with synthetic gut at 55 pounds. And I'll tell you how I know roughly how much string I want to cut off the reel without wasting a tremendous amount or having a, a lot of excess. I'll have a little bit left over and of course I'll measure the overage so that the next time I would deduct that and not, not cut that much off. So this is a Pro Staff 97 with an 1816 pattern. So it's almost the same hoop size as a Blade 98. And of course the Blade 98 comes in a 1619 pattern and an 1820. So if you think about a Blade 98 in the 1820 pattern and this 97 in an 1816 pattern, pretty much the same hoop size. The difference is the blade has 20 crosses, which is four more than this one. So this has 16 crosses instead of 20. So when I strung a Blade 98 in the 1820 pattern with synthetic gut recently, I cut 34 feet 9 inches off of the reel and I had a few inches extra. And I think with this particular racket having four cross strings less and the cross strings are about 9 inches across. So if I take 9 inches across times four strings that won't be on this racket that would be on the other one, 9 times 4 is 36, 36 inches, which is 3 feet. So I'm going to take 3 feet less than I did for that blade 98. So instead of 34 feet 9 inches, I'm going to cut off 31 feet 9 inches and it'll be plenty for this. I'll still probably have a little extra left over, but rather to have a little extra than a little, come up a little short. Obviously if I come up a wee bit short, I can use a starting clamp to bridge to the tension head. But I should be okay. And my short side, I'm going to use the same short side that I used on the Blade 98 because I did all nine mains on the short side plus the top cross or actually it was the bottom cross on the blade 98 because it was an around the world pattern but nonetheless nine mains plus one of the crosses I used 10 feet 4 inches for the short side so for this racket 31 feet 9 inches cutting from the reel and then I'll use a 10 foot 4 inch short side so let's get this set up for 55 pounds Go ahead and set the tension to 55 pounds, which is not going to change for the mains and the crosses, so it'll be 55 throughout. So since a racket length is 27 inches, 14 racket lengths will be exactly 31 and a half feet. So all I have to do is measure off 14 racket lengths to give me 31 and a half feet, or 31 feet 6 inches, and then I'll add 3 more inches to that to get my 31 feet 9 inches that I want. So that's prepped for my 3 inches. All I have to do is measure off the 14 racket lengths, put a point on our string, and let's go. It's 2, 4, Six, eight, ten, twelve, and fourteen. So that's thirty one and a half feet. Tack on an additional three inches and cut.
So now I need 10 feet 4 inches for my short side. So that means 4 racket lengths will be 9 feet plus another 1 foot plus 4 inches. So 16 inches. So 4 racket lengths plus 16 inches. 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's 9 feet. That's 10 and 4 inches. So that spot is 10 feet 4 inches from the short end. So let's go ahead and put the short side in. Like I said, it's unusual that we're starting from the throat here on a racket with 18 mains. There are a few others that do it, but you just don't come across them very often. So that'll be the short side. And this will be the long side. And we've got it set at 55 pounds, so we'll be off and running here. As always, I use the Yusuke method for starting my mains. When you see me pinch the string with my fingers pressed against the clamp like that, that's to ensure that the string is not slipping or sliding through the clamp at all. And I always do that on at least the first four mains just to be sure that neither, neither clamp is slipping and I give it two opportunities. If it's going to slip, I'm going to feel it on one of these first two initial pulls. And of course, there's absolutely nothing sliding. <clears throat> Obviously, if there was, I wouldn't be continuing stringing. I would have stopped, started over with a new piece of string. You want your clamps adjusted so that they're just tight enough that the string doesn't slip. Any tighter, and you'll be damaging the string, especially if it's a delicate string, like a delicate multi-filament, a soft multi-filament, or natural gut. Now, this is synthetic gut, so it's highly unlikely that you're going to do any damage to it, but you want to create good practices for when you're working with all types of string, not just when you're working with the delicate stuff.
So this racket, because it has 18 mains, skips 8 and 10 at the head and 8 and 10 at the throat. Um, I'll show you something in a minute regarding blocked holes. It's a little unusual and it has to do with the fact that, as I mentioned, this racket starts at the has 18 mains and starts at the throat and the mains will end at the head. The holes that, because there's two skips at the head and two skips at the throat, typically it's the lower, if there's two skips down here, in this case 8 and 10, 8 gets blocked. But at the top, 8 isn't blocked, but 10 is. In other words, it's the second cross that typically would be blocked towards the head, and it's the bottom cross that typically would have a blocked hole at the throat. However, because of this being sort of a flipped orientation, I'm pretty sure that the blocked grommets end up being the opposite. So um, I anticipate in a moment it'll be not the bottom cross that'll have a blocked grommet, but the second from bottom cross, and it'll be the top cross that has a blocked hole instead of the second. So it'll be the opposite of the way it typically would be. So right now we've got five, six, seven mains tensioned. There's seven on each side. So I've already got the eighth main in on the long side, but not tensioned, as well as the ninth main. So these are all of the mains that'll need to be in the racket. Uh, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, nine, which ends at the head. And so um, before I get, before I tension any further, you can see that this main, what is this, five, six, the seventh main is going towards the head and it loops around and you skip eight at the head. So this loop right here, once I tension this main, this is going to block that hole. So I don't want to tension that just yet. I want to try to get my top cross through there before I ever tension this. So let's see if we resume on the short side. We've got, again, we've got seven mains here. So as I thread the eighth main, I have to skip the eighth hole, which is going to be for the top cross in a minute. So if we get the eighth main in place, of course, skipping the eighth grommet at the throat as well. So if we bring this down, and again, if I tension this now, I'll be blocking that, that hole, that grommet. So if I take the... Now, this trick will only work if you have enough string here. Obviously, if, you've, if this string is very, very long, you'll be able to do what I'm about to do without an additional starting clamp. So I'm going to show you something. Um, go ahead and put the eighth main in, but don't tension it. Skip ten like you're supposed to, and bring the ninth main up, and skip the tenth grommet at the top. In other words, you're just putting these strings in place, but they're not tensioned. So now, if you watch, I'm going to take the tip of the short end and put it through that grommet. So as long as that string, the, the end of this string is through that grommet before I tension this main, this eighth main, I won't have a blocked hole to deal with. So you're just planning ahead. It's smart to do that when you can. So with this string being long enough. Now here's the problem, right? If I put just the tip through there, so how much string do I have here without pulling this tip out of the hoop and out of that hole that I want it in, is this loop over here long enough to reach your tension head? And in my case, it's not. Now, if you've got a, a lockout machine with a crank and you can bring it really close, you might be able to bring your tensioner, your gripper, to reach this without having to do anything at all. But if you have a drop weight, where if your tension head is a fixed distance away from the racket, whereas a crank you're bringing it close in. So this is an electronic tension head. If you have an electronic machine, if you have a drop weight, or if you have a crank that some for some reason the crank can't get close enough to grasp this, or you've cut this string a lot shorter. In other words, this loop doesn't have to be very big. It doesn't have to reach the tension head. If you've got a starting clamp, just set your starting clamp up with a bridge with an extra piece of string like you normally would bridge to the tensioner anyway. And so now I don't need this loop to be very, very long. In fact, I can pull more of it through the frame because I'm just going to grip it right here and bridge to the tension head. So this is a little trick to get the tail of this short side through that hole before I tension this main and block that grommet.
So, now that that one's tensioned, I could go ahead and pull this slack through. And again, I can tension the ninth main if I want to right now, but I'm going to hold off for a moment and come over to the... Actually, I'm not going to do anything on the long side because right now if I tension a string on the long side, the next string that I will tension will be this eighth main right here, and that's the one that would block that hole. So in other words, I'd like to, if I have enough string here, and I don't know if this will work, I'd like to advance this top cross, weave this top cross all the way over, and get it through that grommet, like so. Now I don't need anything more than just the tip protruding through there. So again, with the tail through that hole, with the, with the top cross already in place, I've got the tail through the frame over here. Now, and I will do the same thing here, I will tension this loop, not by reaching the tension head, but with the starting clamp in a moment. But I don't like to tension two or more strings ahead on one side. So right now, they were even until I moved tension to this eighth main. So now I would like to tension the eighth main on the long side to keep the racket and the tension balanced. So we're tension the eighth main on the long side. Move our clamp. And now I can go ahead and pull most of this string through on the long side which is our ninth main, our outer main here. Now again, when I tension the outer mains, we'll be blocking a hole down here. So I'm going to put a ribbon here and, and here like I normally do. If you've watched my other videos, you've seen me put ribbons where I'm going to have blocked holes because I can't get a string down here. This is going to be the last string or one of the, the two last strings that I weave on the racket. So you can't get the tip of the string there ahead of time. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to pull this through and I'm going to go ahead and get my second before these two clamps are up here and in my own way for weaving crosses I've got the top cross in place I'm going to bring the second cross in as well And I'm actually going to fan and bring most of this string through because this enormous loop that's over here, once I tension this string and bring this clamp up here, there'll be, actually on this racket there won't be, but many times when you bring this clamp up here you'll create additional friction that this string that you're trying to bring through has to work around. But just out of habit, I typically advance the string, go ahead and fan this and, and bring this through and make this loop only as small as necessary. I'm sorry, only as big as necessary and as small as possible. So I'm going to leave this long enough to reach this loop over here long enough to reach the tension head and pull most of this second cross through. So let's go ahead and tension the ninth mains or outer mains on both sides. But before I do that, let me get my ribbon in place. On each side. So here's where I'm going to use the starting clamp once again to tension this short loop so that I don't pull my top cross out of the grommet over here. And just like before, if I tension one string on one side, I'm going to now tension the next string on the opposite side.
So now I'll bring the rest of the second cross through. It's got a small twist in it that I'd like removed before I continue. There we go. And now I can bring the second, I'm sorry, the top cross through. I want to make sure my string is routed correctly over here so that I don't get a crossover. And I want this string under this loop, which it already is. And this is going to be the third cross in a moment. So I can go ahead and tension the top cross now and hold that with a starting clamp. And by the way, um, I know I already tensioned it, but the amount protruding past the end of the gripper is about an inch and a half. So I probably could have done this with a slightly shorter short side than I did. Again, this was 10 feet 4 inches, and I easily reached the back of the gripper. In fact, I could, I could do with a couple inches less next time if I really wanted to cut it close. Now, of course, I can't move my machine clamp here, so that's why we put the starting clamp to hold the top cross. This is very much like a lot of around the world patterns where you do the same thing. So now this clamp over here, I'm sorry, your short side clamp is now freed up and no longer needs to be in your way. So now I can go ahead and finish weaving my third cross. I could tension the second cross now, but I like to weave my crosses one ahead. Most good stringers do. It reduces friction. It makes it's, The weaving is actually easier and it reduces friction on the string and wear and tear on the string. Again, very important when you're working with more delicate strings than say polyester or even a synthetic gut like this. So now we'll tension the second cross. And of course the machine clamp is free, freed up to do that. You see me press my finger here uh, on the first cross or two that I'm tensioning because I have to readjust the clamps when I'm doing the crosses. And again, I want to make sure that there's no slipping going on. And now that that clamp is holding the second cross, this clamp over here can be moved out of your way so that you can thread, finish threading that third cross through the grommet on that side. And so now, it's just like any other string job where you're going to weave your way down the racket, installing your crosses from the top down. string is wrapped around the entire tool tray. Go ahead and move these out of the way before we have a whole bunch of crosses in there. Now we can tension the third. If you're wondering, if you've watched my other videos, you'll notice that I generally pull, I'm sorry, push weave a lot. 
especially on the initial crosses, I don't do a lot of pull weaves, and that's what I'm doing now. It's because my hands are so cold that my fingers can't feel very well to, to do any push weaving. I could try it, but I probably would not be very successful. So since my fingertips are cold, it may be better to, I'll try to do a push weave here. <laughs> I can do it, but it's pretty tricky with cold fingers. Let's try another push weave and see how it goes. May revert back to the pull weaves. Yeah, warming up my fingers helped a little bit there.
So that's the second from bottom cross. So as I suspected earlier, so I had mentioned earlier that typically when you have, let me go ahead and put this bottom cross in so that you can see what I'm referencing. But watch how easy it is to put this bottom cross in because normally the bottom cross would have been the one blocked when you have two skips down here. But that's big, that, uh, that happens when you have, uh, that can happen on a, a 16 main racket that skips 7 and 9 or an 18 main racket like this that skips 8 and 10. But um, let me put this bottom cross through here. And you'll see, so notice how easily that went through that grommet it, because it was not blocked. And ordinarily, I shouldn't say ordinarily, but oftentimes it is. And again, there is no loop of string here on uh, grommet 8. So in other words, you have 8 and 10 are where your top and your second cross are. And then you have 8 and 10 throat where your second from bottom and bottom cross are. And usually the way the holes get blocked with the, the mains, once the mains have been tensioned, typically what ends up being blocked is the top cross, these grommets up here, which would be 7 sometimes, or in this case it's number 8. Normally that's the one that would be blocked and the second one wouldn't. And then down at the bottom, the second from bottom cross, or the penultimate cross, would not have a blocked hole, but the bottom cross is the one that gives you trouble. Um, it, some of you may have had a lot of trouble, a lot of Wilson rackets that skip 7 and 9 down here, and the, and the mains tie off at 6 throat. It ends up with a double block at 7. Um, or once Babala went to the pure arrow, the, the pure arrows... Um, they now have two skips down here. Now they don't have a double block, but they do have a blocked hole that's not really fun to deal with down there at seven throat. At any rate, so my point is, is typically, if you focus on just the bottom two crosses and the top two crosses, it's usually the second cross that's blocked at the head and the bottom cross that's blocked at the throat. And on this racket, because of the sort of flip orientation of where we started the mains, the mains starting at the throat and the mains ending at the throat, I'm sorry, the main starting at the throat and ending at the head with 18 mains, what's happened is it's not the bottom cross that got blocked as it normally would be. It was the second from bottom cross and it wasn't the second from top cross that normally would be. It was the upper uh, cross. So the top cross had blocked holes at eight head and it was the second from bottom cross or the penultimate cross at 10 throat that is blocked on this type racket with this orientation. Anyway, it's just interesting to note that the holes that are blocked, it's the same number of blocked holes, but where they get blocked is a little bit different. So if you string a lot of rackets, you're more accustomed to seeing the other orientation. So this, if you're not looking at it as you're paying attention as you go, it'd be very easy to tension some strings and block some holes and not have planned accordingly uh, ahead of time. Because generally I like to plan ahead and get the string through there if I can, the way I dealt with it at the top, or put ribbons down here. I try not to resort to alls. I have a Pathfinder all if I really need to resort to it. Um, but there's just, there's other tricks of the trade that can make blocked holes a lot easier. The, the best approach is to get the string that's going to be blocked through there if you can in advance, the way I did up here. I only had really two blocked holes on this whole racket to deal with and you saw how easy it was for me to install, uh, just rewind it if you weren't paying attention. This second from bottom cross, I dealt with it with, without uh, any trouble at all. And then of course the bottom cross has no block whatsoever. So how do I do on, uh, on string length? Well, here's my tail. Um, if I don't go around the Diablo, it's extending. three and a half inches past the uh, end of the gripper. And with that kind of additional length, so obviously this could be a little bit shorter next time, I would deduct that, I would uh, make the short side, what did I say earlier, an inch and a half, two inches shorter. And then this could be three inches or three and a half inches shorter. So that would save, you know, five inches, almost six inches 
the next time I cut it. So you can see I don't waste a lot of string, and the next time they'll be even less wasted than this time. But uh, I actually have enough here that I can actually go around my Diablo and get into the gripper. But normally I don't count on that. I frequently, when I cut string from reels, I intentionally cut links that are just long enough to string the racket and do the tie-offs, but not to reach the back of the tension head. I resort to using my starting clamp that I already have set up to bridge, to bridge those final strings, all in an effort to conserve string off of the reels, whether they're my reels or whether they're someone else's reels. So I know how to save a lot of string. Now think about where your craw, uh, you want to make sure when you place your clamps, in a minute I'll be doing it up here at the top, when you go to clamp your bottom cross and your top cross, don't put the clamp in your way of your own tie-off. Make sure you know where the tie-off, the tie-off's going to be down here at number six on this racket. And in other words, it's going to be going through this grommet and this hole right here. Maybe hard to see on the camera. This this uh, mount is probably blocking your view, but I already have the string under tension. But this is where I'm going to put the tail through, so I I know that already. So I don't want to put my clamp in a place that's going to block that and make that job hard on myself. And as usual, I always use a Parnell knot. There'll be nothing different going on here. Now I have two, I have multiple starting clamps, so I can grab an extra starting clamp and tighten this knot right now. But if you're doing this in the way I'm doing it, and you only have one starting clamp, um, just leave this machine clamp in place and don't tighten this, because this one can be freed up to come up here for the top cross. So I can tension the top cross. and clamp to free up my starting clamp. Now I can tie off the top cross or the bottom cross, whichever one I want to tie off first. So if you only have one starting clamp, make sure that you don't have it tied up somewhere that you can't get it free. And again, this is a Parnell knot. I use Parnell knots almost exclusively in very, very tight places where there isn't really room to do a Parnell. I'll use a Wilson Pro knot. But I, I only use it when I have to because of uh, I'm tying off in tight quarters. So very little string wasted. Make sure that there's no sharp edges left on the tails of my string. You'll see me do this on all, all the rackets that I do. Especially polyester. When you cut off poly, it's such a hard material that that edge, you can have a very, very sharp string there. And I don't want anybody getting cut their fingers. You know, when you cradle a racket, when you're during play, the crosses that are down here at the throat, your finger might encounter that. Um, and I don't want anybody's finger getting cut. I also don't want anyone tearing a hole or a rip in their tennis bag as they're putting a tennis racket away in their bag or retrieving a, a racket from their bag. If that tail was a little long and had a sharp edge on it, it can slice the lining, uh, those uh, thermal linings, those foil linings, or, or even fabric. Uh, polyester is no fun, or you know, if it were to pass by your leg on a stroke or as you're walking around the court, you just don't want anybody to get hurt. So I trim the tails nice and short and make sure that they have nice finger-friendly edges. 
So we're going to do some final straightening and we're all done. So those are pretty darn straight as is. We'll give them a few taps just to make sure that they're absolutely perfect. But with these spin effect rackets, with the crosses being a little further apart than a standard racket, it's easier to keep your crosses straight as you're stringing and as you're tensioning. So there's actually a little less curvature in the strings when you're done with the string job. The worst are like really dense patterns, 18, 18 by 20 patterns on a small head racket where the squares get really small. It wants to push those crosses away from the rest of them. Anyway, that's it. Wilson Pro Staff 97 LS, which is the spin effect, 1816 pattern with synthetic gut at 55 pounds with a natural one piece string job where the mains end at the head and incorporating the top cross into the short side. So thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed.